Um, the title, we're doing relationships this month, and um, the title of what I'm going to preach on, teach on, is What is Love? Now, I've been a Christian a long while, so my understanding of love is still growing, especially um, when it's challenged. <laughs> and it's challenged probably daily, sometimes. If you're in a family, if you're around people, then your um, implementation, your behaviour around love will be challenged. It, it's just not possible to go through life without it being challenged. So I thought, well, I really need to understand it a bit better. Um, so I, I thought, well, look at the world. So I looked it up on the internet for great love stories. And they're all really dismal and horrible. It's just really depressing. And I thought, well, I can't share any of them. Um, so then I went to the dictionary and I thought, well, <clears throat> you know, dictionaries, I love English, so there'll be a great definition in the dictionaries. Uh, Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines it as a strong affection for another arising out of kinship or personal ties or a warm attachment, enthusiasm or devotion. Really? That just left me a bit cold. I thought, enthusiasm, is that like when you say, oh, I love that car? Oh, I love that chocolate. I love chocolate. Um, no, I don't, I don't think that really covers it. Uh, Collins Dictionary says, you say that you love someone when their happiness is very important to you. So it's all about you. Um, no, I don't, I don't really think that's right either. So I thought, well, I'm going to have to go to the absolute... A definitive answer for love are kids. Let's go see what kids have to say about love. Four to eight-year-olds describe love this way. Rebecca, aged eight, said, when my grandmother got arthritis, she couldn't bend over and paint her toenails anymore. So my grandfather does it for her all the time, even when his hands got arthritis too. That's what I did too. I went, oh because I'm getting close to that, but anyhow. <laughs> How are your hands, Miles? <laughs> <sighs> this little girl said, when you love someone, you should treat them like in a special way, like um, if my mum, like she wants to like read a book in bed, you can tell it's a child. <laughs> Uh, then my dad, like, he'll go to bed too. Uh, but if my mum wants to watch TV, my dad will watch TV. It's, it's like my dad sort of appreciates her. So whatever my one, mum wants to do, he'll do too. That's love. Oh, this is good. Uh, love is when mummy makes coffee for my daddy and she takes a sip first just to make sure it tastes okay. <laughs> this is classic. This is classic. Love is what's in the room with you at Christmas if you stop opening presents and just listen. Oh, that's really good. Um, I love this one. This little girl said, love is when you tell a guy that you like his shirt and then he wears it every day. <laughs> this one, this is the last one. This girl is obviously selfless. Uh, I know my older sister loves me because she gives me all her old clothes and then she has to go out and buy new ones. <laughs> Classic. It still doesn't totally cover it for me, so I think we'll turn to scripture. What do you reckon? Yeah. Okay. So uh, Mark 12, 29 to 34, Jesus is giving a bit of a definition about love here. And um, he's talking to a scribe who's asked him a question. And we'll have that on the screen. Jesus answered him, yep. The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the first commandment and the second like it is this. You shall love your neighbour as yourself and there's no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, well said, teacher. <laughs> Sorry, I have to laugh there. This guy's saying that to God. 
anyway, you've spoken the truth. (laughs) For there is one God and there's no other but he. And so to love him with all your heart, with all understanding, with all the soul, with all strength, and to love one's neighbour as oneself is more than the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now, when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. There's a key. You are not far from the kingdom of God when you have that sort of love. In Romans 13, 8 to 10, Paul gives us a bit more of a definition. He says, Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For, you, uh, for the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, are all summed up in these saying, namely, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbour. Therefore, love is the fulfilment of the law. So we're seeing in these scriptures so far that there's love to God which demands our all and if we get that right, then there's love to the neighbour that can go out from that. And uh, so one more, Galatians 5, 22 to 23. This is a beautiful definition. The, The fruit of the Spirit is love. And you could just leave it there because that's the whole fruit. It's called love. We read it wrongly and sort of break it up into segments, but love is now broken up into segments. Uh, It's joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. So our first takeaway, I want you to write this down if you're taking notes. Write this down. Love is the fulfilment of all the law. And it amounts to more than all the sacrifices and all works. So if we can get this right, we're doing pretty good. I had a light bulb moment a couple of weeks back, though, when I was um, listening to, I can't even forget who it was, I forget who it was now, but they were talking about the Hebrew word study on the word love. And so uh, we're going to have that up there. Um, Ahabta, or ahava, equals the Hebrew word for love. And the root word of ahava, love, is ahav, or yabba. That's Yod, Beth, and Hay. Ahav is to give. So contained in the word Hebrew word love, in the core of it, is the Hebrew word for give, to give. So the Hebrew mind is more concerned with giving than receiving. If you love, you give. That's the way the Hebrew people think. That's the way God thinks. If you love, you give. It's not about you. It's about the other person. It's about God giving to him and it's receiving his love and then we give to everybody else out of his love. So it's such a, like my my brain, it literally went ding. I thought, wow, that is so cool. So then I thought the first time that that word ahav is in the scriptures is in Genesis 22, 1 to 12, I don't want to turn there. I just want to quickly, you look it up later on. Genesis 22, 1 to 12. Abraham's told by God, take your son, your only son that you love, your beloved, and offer him to me as a sacrifice. So God is testing Abraham's love. He's saying, if you love, you will give. And so Abraham doesn't even question it. We see Abraham now in total obedience, immediate obedience. Next day, straight up. Come on, son, we're going. Where are we going, Dad? We're going to make a sacrifice to God. Okay. They go along, they get to Mount Moriah, and the son says, Dad, where's the sacrifice? And Father God says, God will provide. That obedience, immediate obedience, that sacrificial giving also knows from him I've received, he'll do everything. You know, just Abraham operated in that and obviously Isaac agreed with his father and joined him in agreement. It says they agreed and went together as one. Beautiful. The next place I saw that this word occurred was in Ruth. 
in the chapter. I've just been consumed by Ruth lately. Um, and, and that was that Ruth loved her husband. Uh, she's a Moabitess. He was Jewish, uh, loved her husband, and therefore loved her mother-in-law. You know, and it says, Naomi says, after, after her husband's died, Elimelech, and after Marlon and Kilian have died, she's left destitute in the land of Moab, and she's just got these two daughters-in-law who are Moabites, and she says, famine's over in Bethlehem, I'm going to go home. And Naomi says, the two girls go, well, we'll go with you. Naomi starts outlining all the reasons why they shouldn't. They're logical reasons, and both girls listen to them. I've been cursed by the Lord. She really believes that, and the Lord would back her up. The boys married Moabites. Anybody that marries a Moabite is cursed. And so she goes, I'm cursed. You're not going to be blessed if you're with me. I'm old. I don't have a husband. I can't give you another son. Even if I bore one tomorrow, married and had a son tomorrow, would you wait for him to grow up? That's just silly. So these are all these good reasons, logical reasons, why the girls should not go with them, with her. And then she says, and on top of it, I'm going back bitter. I'm going back empty. I have nothing to give you. And Orpah looks at this logically, she looks at it in the natural, and she says, you're right, therefore I'm going to go back. I'm going to return to what I know. Ruth looks at it with the eye of faith and with honour for Naomi, and she says, no, I'm leaving behind everything I have. I'm leaving behind what I know. I'm leaving behind my gods. We get that beautiful passage where it says, your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. And may it be that way until death do us part. And, it's you know, we use that at marriage ceremonies. It is so beautiful. But here we have an example of giving love, sacrificial love. And Naomi is honoured by that, by her daughter-in-law Ruth, but Ruth gives it because she loves her. But my favourite, probably, so, oh, the takeaway from that, by the way, is, and I wrote this one down, obedience is the essence of worship, as we saw in Abraham, and love in relationship, like we see in Abraham and Ruth, is the foundation for the kingdom. Obedience is the essence of worship and love and relationship is the foundation for the kingdom. Let's turn to 2 Samuel 21, 1 to 14, to a very interesting part in Israel's history and to a woman that has been uh, one of my heroes forever. I just, when I first read this account, my heart went out to this woman And it's only recently as I've been studying to prepare this message that I got such new insights into her that really blessed me in linking her with the Lord. Uh, We'll read this together. Um, 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse 1. Now, there was a famine in the days of David for three years. Say three years. Three years. You're so obedient. It's great. I love it. I've always wanted to do that. Sorry. (laughs) They do it on TV a lot, you know, and I just, I love that. (laughs) So it was for three years, year after year. And David inquired of the Lord and the Lord answered, it's because of Saul and his bloodthirsty house, because he killed the Gibeonites. David's pretty smart. The first year of drought, he went, that could be natural. Second year of drought, he went, it's a bad drought. Third year of drought, and he went, something is wrong between us and God. Because he knew that the blessing was about the rains coming, the former rains and the latter rains, and it affecting the harvest. 
So he went to God and he asked him, and God told him the problem lay with Saul, the dead king, and what he'd done to the Gibeonites. And I've got to tell you, I bet David had a chill run right down his spine at that point. Because what he knew was that 400 years previous to that, Joshua and the Israelites had made a covenant with the Gibeonites. They were Amorites, but they came from the area of Gibeon there. And they had been tricked into making a covenant with them. It was made in deceit, but nevertheless, it was a covenant. See, they didn't inquire of the Lord before they made that covenant. And now 400 years later, it's having a massive impact. It's causing drought. Why? Because Saul had attacked the Gibeonites and tried to do an ethnic cleansing of them from the land of Israel. And he'd bloodthirstily gone through, hunted out as many Gibeonites as he could find and killed them and assaulted them and he'd broken covenant. And there's always a cost to breaking a covenant. One of the things that we see here, and you can note this, is that God expects us to keep our promises. He especially expects us to keep our covenants. He even expects nations to keep their promises. Time doesn't diminish our obligation to those promises or those covenants. And God's correction may come a long time. This could have been months or even years after Saul did this. But it was happening now. Let's read on. So the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites, this is verse 2, were not the children of Israel, but the remnant of the Amorites. The children of Israel had sworn protection to them, but Saul had sought to kill them in his zeal for the children of Israel and Judah. Therefore David said to the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you? And with what shall I make atonement that you may bless the inheritance of the Lord. It would have been so easy if they'd asked for half of his wealth. Maybe they said, look, you know, we just want all your gold and silver. Um, We want maybe all of your weapons. That would have been easy to do. And the Gibeonites said to him, we will have no silver or gold from Saul or his house, nor shall you kill any man in Israel for us. In other words, well, there were 5,000 of us killed. What about 5,000 of you guys? No, they didn't ask for that. So he said, whatever you say, I will do for you. Then they answered the king, as for the man who consumed us, plotted against us, that we should be destroyed from remaining in any of the territories of Israel, let seven men of his descendants be delivered to us, and we will hang them before the Lord in Gibeah of Saul, whom the Lord chose. That title, that term, hang them before the Lord, means that it was something that God said had to happen. And the king said, I will give them. But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the Lord's oath that was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. Why? Because David had a covenant with Saul. You can't break one covenant to fix another one. There has to be a way around it. So he couldn't give Mephibosheth. He protected Mephibosheth, the oldest son of Saul. Of Well, the oldest one it would have been Jonathan's son. But he was the one next in line to the throne. He protected him because he promised that to Jonathan. David really knew how to work with the Lord. Verse 8, So the king took Armoni and Mephibosheth, another Mephibosheth, the two sons of Rizpah, here's our girl, the daughter of Aya, whom she bore to Saul, and five sons of Michal, the daughter of Saul, whom she brought up for Adriel, the son of Barzillai, the, that guy. And he delivered them into the hands of the Gibeonites and they hanged them on the hill before the Lord. So they fell, all seven together, and were put to death in the days of the harvest, in the first days, in the beginning of the barley harvest. Now Rizpah, the daughter of Ai, took sackcloth and spread it for herself on the rock from the beginning of the harvest until the late rains poured on them from heaven. 
And she did not allow the birds of the air to rest on them by day, nor the beasts of the field by night. We're just going to stop there for a minute. Wow. What a picture. At the beginning of the barley harvest, these seven sons, grandsons of Saul were taken and were hanged. And Mephibosheth, the mother of two of them, takes sackcloth, spreads it out in front of where they're hanged and she stays there night and day, night and day, day and night, chasing away the crows and the ravens and the vultures and then at night time um, there's foxes, there's wolves, there's jackals, maybe a lion or two. She's chasing away all of them. Why? Because she loves her boys. Because she loves. And while she does that for them, she does it for the other five as well. It's a love that gives. It's a love that honours. It's a love that's loyal. It's a love that will not give in. Rizpah's name means pavement. It's set. She's made a decision. It's an intentional decision. I'm here for the long haul. I'm here to stay. I am going to keep vigil here and I'm going to honour my sons. I don't know what she was feeling, but I guarantee it wasn't anything really good. It was grief, horror, trauma. Just imagine how long it was. It says from the days of the barley harvest. If we read on, it wasn't until the late rains finally came. Do you know how long that is? Five to six months. She stayed there five to six months. An incredible amount of devotion and love shown by this immensely tough woman. She was determined, she was set, she was going to do this. Let's just read on. And David was told what Rizpah, the daughter of Ayah, the concubine of Saul, had done. Verse 12, Then David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan his son with the men of uh, Jabesh Gilead who had stolen them from the street of Beth Shan where the Philistines had hung them up after the Philistines had struck down Saul in Gilboa. So he brought up the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan his son from there and they gathered the bones of those who had been hanged They buried the bones of Saul and Jonathan, his son, in the country of Benjamin in Zillah, in the tomb of Kish, his father. So they performed all that the king commanded. And after that, God heeded the prayer for the land. In Deuteronomy 22, it says there, sorry, Deuteronomy 21, 23, for he who is hanged is accursed of God. This law also said, The body was to be taken down before sunset. It wasn't to be hanging overnight because otherwise it would defile the land. But in this case, we see that what happened was the bodies of these seven sons of Saul hanged there for five to six months. Can you imagine what state they were in when they find it? They would have just been bones and sinew. And Rizpah kept her vigil. Rizpah never gave up. At some stage, somebody was going to honour these bodies and was going to bury them properly, and she wasn't leaving until that happened. What an amazing woman. That's love. That is such love. It leads me to another mother who had to keep vigil as her son was hung. They hanged him. There was shame. There was trauma, there was grief, there was anguish. Maybe in her heart there was a lack of understanding. Why? Why is this happening? A sword pierced her heart, the prophecy said. Any mother here in this building at the moment would go, oh my God, I don't know how I'd do that. I don't know how that would happen. But Mary stayed there with the love that she had for Jesus. Not just as a mother, as a disciple. She was a disciple with love for her Lord. She wasn't leaving. It didn't matter what shame was happening. She wasn't leaving. 
She was staying there. We know that they brought the body down before sunset and buried him properly. But it's so amazing that here we have these seven men who had to bear, they had to become a curse so that Israel could be atoned for. And then we have Jesus. They didn't, those seven guys had no say in the matter. Was it unfair? To them it was. To Rizpah it definitely was. But it was necessary because a covenant had been broken. We broke covenant. We couldn't keep covenant. There's no amount of sin that we could make, this, not any amount of sin that we could make atonement for. It's not possible. And so Jesus willingly took on him the curse. He became that curse for us. He bore it. And that's not fair. He didn't deserve it. But he took it for us. And it is so beautiful. It says in Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it's written, referring back to Deuteronomy, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Huh. It's amazing to me that this incident there with the seven sons of Saul and Rizpah is like an echo through time of what Jesus would go through and what Mary would go through for us. For us. It was a shadow of what would happen at Calvary. Ha! Huh. That is so beautiful. Love. Such Love. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave. He gave. His only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And in John 15... 12 to 13, Jesus himself said, this is my commandment. Not a suggestion. Church, we are commanded that you love one another as I have loved you. That's that giving love. It's not about me. It's about receiving from him because we love because he first loved us. And then we return to him, and out of that relationship, we love one another as he loved us. And then he says, Greater love has no one than this, than he lay down one's life for his friends. Greater love. So your takeaways from this, let me just run through them again. Obedience is the essence of worship. And giving love in relationship is the foundation for the kingdom. Love is the fulfilment of all the law and amounts to more than all the sacrifices and works. Love is greater. It's greater love because it's sacrificial giving love. And love is a commandment. For a further definition... Let's just look at 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7. This is what it looks like. Love suffers long. It's kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And then in the Passion Translation, in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1, it says, well, in New King James, it says, so pursue love. But in the Passion Translation, it says, so above all else, let love be the beautiful prize for which you run above all else. 
I'm encouraged, but I'm also know after doing this study that I've got a long way to go.